show you that from time to time, paper suspension revisits various subjects uh, for technical and other reasons and hence on the 16th of February 2015, some five years after we originally spoke to him, we took another opportunity to speak with uh, Robert Wallace to get his uh, views on a variety of subjects, uh, ranging back from his time in the BB, the famous BB uh, Pipe Band 214, uh, Muirhead and Sons, ranging through his uh, long solo piping career where he's got uh, general bits of advice and all the rest of it in common, um, his journalism, his folk groups, uh, whistle binkies, etc. Very, very interesting that. And his time as principal of the College of Piping and subsequently his current activities with Piping Press. But we wound up with a general session on the commentary on the, the, the scene, the three disciplines uh, that we've mentioned, the pipe band, the soul piping and the folk scene. And uh, that's, that's quite interesting uh, as well. So uh, what I've got to say is, uh, like Robert or otherwise, but uh, you could uh, agree that he does express himself forthrightly on any number of subjects and you continue to watch and listen. Amongst this there are very valuable comments and advice and perhaps there could be more clarity in the future in comments uh, from many of you on the piping scene. Uh, well, uh, not uh, necessarily sharing the, the views of the interviews. We try to be empathetic uh, and we do enjoy the, the, the views. And we hope that uh, the thoughts expressed here and with the other interviewees are interesting and informative. So we ask you to, as usual, sit back and enjoy. Right, good morning, Robert. Hey. Um, we're going to cover a wee bit of ground today, hopefully, and with a, I think we normally start chronologically and we just start with your background piping, mm -hmm. a way back, and um, uh, the 214 BB pipe band, uh, tell us a wee bit about the band, the background of the band, and uh, how you came into it, etc. Yeah. Well, we were very lucky. We moved from Clyde Bank when I was about eight years of age, and um, in the same clothes that we lived in was Alec Ibel, and he taught all the wee boys, all the urchins, uh, grabbed them for the, the 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 BB band. He was the main instructor. He had been pipe major of the band, and he gave that up when MacIver, Alec MacIver, came back from the war and they uh, took over the BB band. They were a very successful band. I, of course, knew nothing about it. But there was music in the family. My father was a, a, a jazz musician. And um, well, I was out playing football one night, and one of the guys said, oh, I need to go. I'm going to my chanter lessons. Finley Drennan, his name was. And uh, he said, do you want to come? I went, mm, aye, OK. So he said, well, I'll tell Mr. Ibel you're going to come. So I, I never thought any more of it until a few days later, Alec had gone up to the house and said, where was I? Because he, you know, um, I was nowhere to be seen, so I got ordered to go to his house and that was the start of it. And he was, you know, nobody had any money, the lessons were free, gave you an old practice chanter and a Logan's tutor, one Logan's tutor between about six of us and we all had to copy out a manuscript. I was sent out to Granger and Campbell's to wee Donald at Granger and Campbell's, that was 60... Must have been 1960, eh? Must have been 1960. And uh, we had to actually copy by hand the Logan's tutor into the wee manuscript. But I've still got it to this day. Right, right. And um, that was just, just what you had to do. And he, he, his theory was, well, firstly, you didn't need to buy a book. And secondly, what, uh, um, you, you, you helped you learn the, the, the um, helped you learn the things if you had to write it, you know? Right. So it was quite a, so it was with, with Alec and the boys for about a year learning scale right through the Logan's book. 
No tunes. No tunes for a year. No tunes for a year. Uh -huh. And he was a stickler for 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 um, you used to hit the, the chanter on the you know uh, if your fingers were bent or anything like that, you know. And I suppose this was the foundation of the two one four kind of factory, if you like, and the, the good players that all came through him was this foundation of fingering. You never, you, nobody was allowed on parade unless they could finger properly. You weren't allowed on a tune until you could play the, the tunes accurately on the, the chanter. And um, Did he do anything about the back thumbs? What do you mean the back thumbs? The position of the thumb. Well, he always we put a wee mark on the back of the, the, um, the chanter. And I see now an awful lot of boys playing with a thumb away down here right. and it's absolutely these people get the real problems for later life right. and you know we were never allowed it below the middle finger uh, the lowest it could be would be on the middle finger probably more between the two between the two aye. Yeah. And comfortably you, if you look at it that's comfortable that's suddenly I see something <coughs> like that now away down here well anyway we never had that so we mark in the back of the chanter and uh, you were kind of in Inculcated into the piping thing, and uh, when you left the life boys, you joined the BB. And once you were in the BB, your, your lessons you had to go to the band practice. Then we went to the half size set. The wee miniature set, and actually, for to learn to blow on. Then the half size set, and then you got onto the full set. You know, and none of none of us had uh, any instruments. We were all very poor. I think you'd have to say none. None of the parents of all the boys could afford the lessons if it had to pay for them. So that man gave his time and his dedication for free. Amazing, eh? Fantastic, you know. Aye. Can you remember other chaps in the band uh, learning, uh, you know, characters' names? Aye, well, Ronnie Elmsley <coughs> started the same time as me. Ronnie was uh, Doogie's younger brother, yeah, Jim's yeah. younger brother. They, they both played in the Muirheads band. So well, we were all three of them played in the Muirheads band. And um, the... Uh, Finley Drennan, Donny Glass, Alistair Ross, who you'll know through the police. Um, they are maybe a year older than me. Ian Glass, um, Hugh McPhail, a lot of them are, you know, maybe gave up on the, on the thing. But there was quite a, a class, there was a constant throughput of boys learning all the time, you know. Uh, Ian McClellan was well away by that time, you know. Yeah. Um, but he, Callum McKenzie, Jim Marshall, John McDougall, Gordon Ferguson now out in um, out in Australia. Uh -huh. um, he played the Muirheads as well. These guys all went on to play in Grade One bands, you know. So it's a real factory for. It was no great jump when you think of the expertise you'd gained and, and the basic uh, the, the basis of it, all your piping. And I understand they taught you the right way to play six eight and two four marches for instance. Aye, I mean, we, we, Alec, when we, once we left old Alec as we called him, Aye. and we went to Alec MacIver, who's the pipe major, he was a, he was a, I nearly mean, said skiener, he wasn't a skiener, he'd kill me if he'd heard me say that, he was from Lewis, was mm -hmm. it Lewis, I don't know how they say it. Anyway, he was from Lewis, and his big pal, his mentor was Edora McLeod, and um, Alec based everything he taught us on the, on the music that he picked up from from Donald. He was an inherently musical man himself because he was a Gaelic speaker, a Gaelic song, he produced Gaelic plays. He was a very musical guy and a good composer, wrote two or three good tunes himself. But he's his real kind of um, uh, you know the, the person that he kind of always referred back to was 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 we Don McLeod. He spent a lot of time with Donald. And they would rub it away in the Gaelic all the time, and Donald would give us music, we tunes, we tunes aye, and, uh, aye, aye. with the wee Highland Laddie. I remember we had that before it ever appeared in the book, The Cockerel and the Creel. I've still got a copy of it, in mm -hmm. fact. I think I've published it. Uh, co Cockerel and the Creel. We could never play it in the, as boys in the band, with all the top hand to bottom hand stuff, you know. But we had that long before it was ever published, you know. And um, But Alec always said that. They used to discuss teaching, and Donald would say to Alec, "What's the hardest thing you find when you're teaching the boys?" And he said, "It's teaching them music." And Donald said, "Well, I'll tell you something, Alec. You're teaching them correctly then, because trying to impart this music, this right. difference between just staid static playing and the the sort of playing that's 
just get that five percent more. We all recognise it when we hear it. A wee bit of spirit into spirit, the spirit, a bit of blast, you know. Yeah. When you that is says if you can trying to get people to not everybody can do it, you know. Aye. Um so that was so, so that was a kind of um um Lee Donald was a big influence through Alec McIver on the two one four. So how long were you with them? Well you're there until seventeen. Aye. And during the, the, the year, we have, my very first contest was at the Worlds in uh, 1964. It was on a Friday night we were playing. Mm -hmm. Archie McLean and I. Archie was in the band, he's now a well known judge. He lives up in Inverness. His father was John McLean from North Uist, and who at that time was a pipe band adjudicator from the Scots Guards. And um, he told us on a Friday night we were playing Saturday. Uh, Dam Park at Air, 1964 World Championships. Band practice Friday night, I'm 12, Archie's 14. Right boys, end of the practice, you're both playing tomorrow. Gee, you know, <laughs> you can imagine. Still in Shire Militia, John Roy Stewart and Dr McPhail. I uh, kid you not. Nice but, easy tunes, eh? <laughs> uh, age 12, been playing for three. Goodness me, didn't sleep a wink. But it seemed to go all right on the day and we won the... the, the competition so absolutely after that you were kind of hooked. Well we had a progression of a succession rather of successes all the time in the 214 winning the BB3 championship and Crowell and all the juvenile things regularly. Um, a big uh, You're another competitors at that time next with juveniles. Nights with juveniles excellent band and another great um, um, what would you say nursery Aye. you know and the first Port Glasgow BB Aye. down in the down the tail of the bank there, and they, they, these were the main competitors. Um, we really didn't have many more other than that. I remember no. one year the Vancouver Kiwanis came over, um, and they, they were they were very good. They were also smart and healthy looking. It made you sick, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All big guys with tans and perfect kilts. Or you, mean, you didn't even Aye. have kilts, you know. Aye. You Glasgow backles. But, um, that was um, that was the, the BB, and you were there to 17, and obviously uh, when you started to get to about 16, you obviously talked about the... Now, Alec always wanted to push you into the Glasgow Police. He was a great police, police. you know, what about joining the police, sir? What about joining the police? You know, he really was... He's a big fan, right? Always a big fan of the Glasgow Police. And but uh, the, the, the police got an awful lot of people out of that 2 one Aye. Before. Oh, but, incredible. Uh, and he was very, very friendly with Angus MacDonald. MacDonald, yes. Another yeah. Gaelic speaker. I think he was North Uist, wasn't he? He was North Uist, Aye. Yeah. And so he, you know, we get the drums off. The, the, the Glasgow Police are very good to us. Yeah. We, he's, we often get the old drums Aye. and... All that kind of stuff. But Alec oh. Connell, he went to 214 Alec, yeah. uh, uh, BB, so that was the legal stroke right. for uh, 30 right. years or whatever, you know. Incredible. Uh, so obviously the heart was there what too. Was incredible. Know, was incredible. Still, still in McMurchie. Still in McMurchie, yes, yeah. was another one. But what uh, was incredible was MacIver didn't just turn out pipers, he turned out drummers as well. Uh, I mean, it was, they had the uh, wee Joe. Joe Norman, right, that's right. and world champion drummers, and Alec Connell, you mentioned Robert Turner, mm -hmm. fantastic still in McMurchie, and there was a whole host of others, and they went through all the grade one bands, and it was an incredible um, nursery, you know. It was a wonderful gift to Glasgow, really. Aye, I yeah, it, was, it was just pure luck that I really ended up there, you know, I did an LP subsequently in years, and, uh, and it was called Chance Was A Fine Thing and it was purely by chance yeah. that I met on this, you know, this academy of, of excellence really right. in, the, in the middle of Glasgow in the 1960s, the tenement, these dedicated men, dedicated just pass it to pass on their knowledge, you know, yeah. it was just very, very lucky. And, um, but the, the point I was going to go on to make, Alan, was that at that time Bob Hardy um, had sent his son Jim down to 214 presumably recognising that if he's going to get the boy to play with a band, he wants to play with, with ourselves. So he came down, Jim was sent down, and Ian MacDonald, that was Angus MacDonald's son, he was sent down as yeah. well. He played with the 2142 and came right through the ranks. And so when Jim was coming down, um, kind of, um, I got to know Bob a wee bit, you know, who was quite a taciturn individual. Didn't really get to know him, but he was always kind of um, looking for half-decent players, you know, and... When it came to 1970, I think it was, 
1970 at uh, Shorts was my last contest. There's the European Championships with last contest with the two on four, and the Muirheads were playing down the road, and they were in the station bar at the hotel at the thing. And I just went up to him and I said, "Would you would you mind if I um, came up to the band to see how I got on?" I okay, he says. Just um, come down to the the mill at Grangemouth, you know. So. A couple of weeks later, sure enough, pipes, wooden box, on the bus, I lived in Cumberland at the time, <laughs> on the bus, <laughs> dropped me, you know, you know Gragemouth, oh, I, I, you imagine Gragemouth at night, all an industrial, just, a, a, just full of chimneys, aye, I, and no houses or nothing, mm -hmm. and I'm walking about this place, and I just, where the hell is a sawmill, so I'm walking for miles through this industrial estate, you know, the, the refinery, and then, Eventually I saw a tower with Muirheads on it. She said, well that must be where it is. <laughs> so I headed for this tower. It was bloody sawmill, piles of wood and everything everywhere, you know. Aye. And sure enough, in the canteen, in the building, I said to the guy at the gatehouse, I'm back, the other back, I saw the pipe box, aye, in you go. And there they were all sitting round the, the table. Well, there wasn't a table, just in a sort of semicircle with chanters out, you know. Aye, then you come and that was it, you know, you try this, try that, and that yeah, was me, you know. Great stuff. Yeah. So, had you, before you went to Muirheads, had you competed in solo competitions? Just in the amateurs, yes, and we were encouraged very much to do all the amateur BB yeah. Championships, RSPBA, West of Scotland Championships, we did all of that, you mm -hmm. know, we were always encouraged to, to, um, play in the show so that was part of the deal yeah um, you know they, it was a way of Im improvement you know and uh, my first chanter contest i remember was angus i played Ang angus mckinnon the 6 8 march i never I, heard that now no mm -hmm. good great tune yeah, great tune I think, I think he played in the edinburgh police band the angus uh -huh. mckinnon uh -huh. who, who wrote was it john turl shaw it might have been Anyway, that was the first year I played, and you know, I couldn't understand why I didn't get a prize. Right. I could not understand <laughs> it. I said, I said, I've done everything Mr. Ibell told me. Right. I never missed all my grace notes, right. all my right. doublings, everything was perfect. I did, how could I not? And I never, you know, I couldn't understand. <laughs> I was only, what, 10 or something, maybe, maybe 11, you know, right. maybe right. something like right. that. So, <laughs> but yeah, we were encouraged all the time to play. We had a, there was a, Another guy that helped in the band, apart from the two Alex, it was Dan Finlay. He he kind of took you when you first went onto the pipes and got you into the way of blowing. And Joe King, Joe was the, I think Joe was um, pipe major of the Renfrew band for yes. a while. And he'd been involved with the 214 for years. And he was a great man for sound. So before the contest, you know, you he would get your pipes going and everything like that. So he... Um, if you got Joe on your side in terms of the, the quality of your instrument, it was that that would be the one thing though that I would say that we probably didn't get enough of was taught how to tune ourselves. Being in a band situation, everything's that's an unfortunate thing, isn't it? Isn't it? You know, hey, the the pipe major tends to just I, do the whole lot. I, that would be the, the only thing. So it was only when I went to the Muirheads band that I started yeah. to develop an ear uh -huh. on trying to tune my own instrument and set it up myself, you know. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, but I mean, I'm not wanting to be in any way critical. They just didn't have the time at the 214 to do it. If you watched and listened, I'm sure the very fact that you were surrounded by good sound and good instruments all the time was... You, you start to get a near anyway. Exactly. You yeah. Know, you know, so... Aye. But, um, uh, aye, a wonderful uh, grounding indeed. Uh, you started to tell us about Muirhead, so just continue uh -huh. uh, and that theme of you. Well, the, the, the Muirhead's band was a... You know, I mean, I, I always felt I could manage it all right, you know, but the, he was a very hard taskmaster, Bob, you know, he was did not suffer fools gladly, and if you didn't think you could, you didn't get to play in the band unless you could play the stuff, you know, and um, if we were competing with Pretty Mary in eight parts, with all the doublings in Ian, <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, but there, was, there was no compromise, either everybody played the stuff, 
Or they didn't play in the band. They played in the gala day band, they didn't play in a competing band. Now, they didn't have a lot of pipers, maybe 10, 12 pipers was a big band then, as you know, Alan. Mm -hmm. But he was a very strict taskmaster. But, you know, what a musician. I mean, uh, I've said this to people before, I don't think, I was with, with Bob for 10 years and I went practice twice a week, maybe more than that, other times, uh, especially in the lead up to the Worlds. And there was not one night I ever went where I didn't come away having picked up something else from that man as regards expression, tuning, uh, timing, tempos, every, all the huge amount of things that you learn, that there is to learn, associated with the bagpipe and its music and pipe bands and their music. He was a fund of uh, knowledge and uh, just a great man to be. As I say, with Bob, it wasn't so much formal learning, it was informal learning. It was up to you to keep your eyes and your ears open. Yep. and take on board and appreciate what you are seeing and hearing mm -hmm. and take it on board and remember it and think about it for yourself. The type of music you were playing in the 70s is different from the music I was playing in the 60s in as much as the, the medley had been introduced. Yes. So uh, could just for the, the viewers in the Pacific or South America or whatever, yeah. uh, what a... Uh, you were at band practices, so what type of music would you go on? Well, when I first went, it would all be six, six eights, two fours. We had Queen of six eights and two fours, and parade marching tunes, and then you had your band, you had your two marks of spades and reels, and, and these were difficult tunes. Your, you know, your Dini Carruthers and uh, Doctor McLeod of Anik and um, Blair Drummond, Pretty Mary, and there was never any comp. John McEfty. Mm -hmm. Loch Cairn, six parts, all the work was there. You know, there was enough to, I mean, it was intense. Then in 1973, I think they introduced the medley. Slightly that before winter. that, I think. Was it before that? Yeah. It, was it, well, it was before that. Because uh, I remember was, playing in, it was in, in the uh, late 60s, very late shots 60s. Won it, when yeah. Shorts won it in 70 at Aberdeen, it was the first year of the medley. You're right. Yeah. And, um, so, of course, we would have medleys as well, but our medleys were based, or most bands' medleys then, were based on not like what you get nowadays, you know, a lot of band-orientated stuff. These were all wee dance tunes put together. Bob's great favourite was the Seaforth Collection, which is a great book full of lots of good quality suspays and reels, wee, wee jigs, wee matches. Wee two parties. Yes, yeah. and he'd stick it all together yeah. into, a, into a, a, a medley, you know. And um, but he applied the same discipline and strictures on that stuff as what he did on you know, Marks of Space and Reels. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was exactly the same. You know, that had to be in there. I mean, that's as difficult to play as. Now, some of these say uh, two parts yeah. of space, very different. Yes. I remember doing that. And Ronnie Laurie was just the same, and Aye. he had to, every GD and E had to be uh, very close and tight and all that Aye. sort of stuff. Oh, right. Right. And, um, you know, so. Whilst the, the sort of. The. the, the uh, what would you say? The performance requirement had changed. Right. He never changed. Mm -hmm. He never compromised anything as regards we must well, we keep that less is playing the easier tunes. No, far from it. Bob would never ha have a have a situation where his band was going to be accused of playing simple simple stuff. Oh but harmonies, bridges and all that no. stuff you get now. No, no interesting. No, no. Rallin Tando, forget it. No. As far as Bob Harvey was concerned, <laughs> he had enough trouble trying to get the precision into the technique. Aye. And, you know, that's why everybody remembers that band, Aye. was because of that precision in playing. And if you hear recordings now, um, then you, you hear what he was getting at. But Rallon Tando's harmonies, maybe in the slow air. Right. If he was feeling kind of right. revolutionary, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but when, like I said, when we John came out with the, the organ and all of that stuff, and 
um, and that, and then the shots had all the, the slowing down and the, the big thing and Muirheads were, were not of that age, were not no. of that era, you know, no. Bob Hardy was not going to go there, <laughs> it was as simple as that, and it may be counted against, I mean, I remember Ian McClellan saying a similar thing, Aye. that he just got out in time before it oh, all yeah. went different for him, yeah, and yeah. it wasn't something he could do or would want to do. No. You know, he was strictly old school as well. Yeah, and that that, that, that was the, the thing. Do you think uh, Bob Shepard had a hand in this as well, or in the background? Oh, okay, I think well, Bob. Well, Bob was a great um, follower of the Muirheads band. I mean, Bob was used to come down to the, the Muirheads, and he absolutely, you know, saw what Bob Hardy was doing. In fact, we told me recently, he says, "I went back. He said, back. He said, I was going to teach your boys the Gina Carrera." He says. After half an hour, it was a waste of time. <laughs> because he heard that what the Muirheads were doing. But, you know, Bob had to work with what he had. And he and, and Bob was an absolute genius in that, in that regard. I mean, what he took these boys that he taught at the English school into, into grade one. Oh, and made them, his watch was simple but effective. Yeah. I might not be able to play to that, but I've got other wee things up my sleeve that I can maybe do that will catch the ear. Right. And he did it. Clever man. Clever man. Aye. Good on him for it as well, Aye. you know. And uh, so I went to Muirhead's uh, band at a kind of, kind of a time of change in the yes. pipe band world. And I don't think Bob played some beautiful uh, medleys, and I still believe we should have won the worlds in '75 at Kirby. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a fantastic performance, and I've heard the I've heard the, um, the recording since, and. Uh, Maybe we shouldn't go there. <laughs> who, who did actually win that? The Edinburgh Police won it. Aye. That was a good yeah. band at the, uh, yes. in the early 70s. Oh, uh, Ian McLeod's band was... Aye. Very, very musical. Musical band and a different style, a more rounder style and a, and a kind of more gentler approach. A much it. higher pitch of instrument too, aye, if I was to recall. Aye. Yes, aye. Uh, I was actually astonished first time I heard them how... Uh -huh. High and sweet they were, but it was a nice. Uh, yeah, they played tunes that suited his style of playing. You yeah. know, like in Inverary Castle and uh, uh -huh. Little Cascade, you could get that. They had a very nice touch. You know, yeah. lovely band to, to hear. And yeah. uh, uh, it wasn't what we did, but um, you know, fantastic. Just like shots as well. I mean, what a sound shots had then. Uh -huh. Alec does it. I remember hearing uh, Inver Gordon as well. Great band. And uh, Duthit was always the one that took the ear and took the eye, though, you know. I remember hearing him at, at Les Mahago and this thing, and I just couldn't believe the, the music that the man had, you know. He could get... They had... It seemed to me that the shots produced the sound, the, Tom and John produced the sound, and the practice and the unison, and Alec gave them the music. Yeah. If they played to Alec, he had to lift and he's to space and he sticks it away up here. And Cameroonian rant was something oh, else. You couldn't help but play Aye. when you had Alec Duthit behind you. Aye. Aye. You know, and uh, that was a great band too, that Shorts oh, band. A wonderful band. Wonderful band. And so was the Red Hackle, a good band, another one in a different way. Yeah. You know, and it had their own attraction, you know, for different people. But these were more or less the, the top band, and of course the Glasgow Police as well. Aye. They came to, to the fore in the late 70s. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they had been very, very good under Angus MacDonald in the mid 60s. That's right. Yeah. Uh, fell away slightly and uh -huh. then they picked up again under Ian. That's right. Once Ian got the sound. Oh, it was yeah. game set and match after that. You know? Right. Yeah. It's one of the great tragedies where the Muirhead's band was allowed to close, you know, and there was this dispute over the Height and ship and one thing and another and um, I have to say though from my time from the minute I joined the band it was downhill all the way I mean, we won nothing right. when I joined <laughs> 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 oh, we, we got, I think we were second in the world once and we won a couple of champions a couple of majors and all that but, uh, Bob's wife had died and I think it was 71 and he was never quite the same after that you know and then, of course, it was the episode of changing the chanters. I know. We, 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 when he, he, got, he was mucking about with the when he lost the worlds in 1970, somebody had said to him, "It was because his pitch was too low." Aye. So he got Jimmy Pettigrew in the shop to, to start mucking about with the jig. So he came down to the band with his dose of chanters. You know, week after week we were tying and he was mucking about. 
And at the end of it all, you know, the season was getting close. Aye. He went in, Jimmy Pettig, who told me this, and he said, to, right, Jimmy, just make me up a batch of the old ones on the old uh, jig. He says, what do you mean, Bob? Aye, the old jig. He says, Bob, we changed it. Bob. So they hadn't kept a no control. Right kept at all. No, they hadn't kept a control of the old jig, so they couldn't <sighs> reproduce. So for that minute onward, the Muirheads never had the sound that they had before. It was always a struggle. Always a struggle. Right. Your modern pipe maker now keeps a, a computer record oh, of everything of from way back. Yeah. So if you get something several years ago and you wanted to add another two or three chanters uh, of the same line, it's yeah. not a bother. No, it's a different, different world then, aye, though, you aye, know. Aye, I mean, exactly. It was, um, but that was, they, they never had a sound. But one of, one of my. Do you think uh, that. Uh, it just uh, I thought it occurs once more. Uh, I remember Jimmy Watt telling me in his interview, he had a theory, it was like James Last and various other bands, was the, the figurehead went, the band should just disperse and go elsewhere. And mm -hmm. the, 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 the band was the pipe major rather than, uh, you know, the, the figurehead. Mm -hmm. um, and one can immediately think of several examples where this may apply. But against that, you have probably other exceptions uh, of bands that have just uh, kept going and uh, they've managed to get new pipe majors of a, a similar standard to the previous chap and they've been lucky. And uh, so there's... Well, I, I think it's a fair point, but at the same time, you know, I, I think it's incumbent on anybody in these positions, especially with these iconic bands like Shorts and Muirheads as they were, that there's a succession planning goes into this thing. The pipe major doesn't overstay his welcome Aye. and he plans for a successor. Yeah. And that's what Muirheads didn't do and that's why there's no Muirheads band today, you know, and I'm not Aye. being critical of Bob because, no. you know, but that would have been the, the, the thing. There might still have been a Muirheads band going today had they done so, you know. And a more positive uh, light, you've got St Lawrence at all who have planned yeah. success. Perfect, uh, perfect. You know, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, they, they haven't uh, had a hiccup really, they've just Not kept on. That's right, and it's supposed to a certain extent shots, but they had a wee bit of a wee bit of a dip and they're now climbing back, you Aye. know. But that, it is important for all bands that you know you if you've got something and you think it's worth holding on to, then you must plan for the future. I'm sure FM, for example, have got something in place. Well, Nobody goes on forever, you know. One would certainly hope so. Oh definitely, yeah. I think we'll uh, move on. Uh, we touched briefly on the solo piping earlier on um, and I know that you're going to tell me about Bob Hardy uh, teaching you Peebra. Mm -hmm. uh, so could we run through the solo mm -hmm. piping career which yeah. was uh, run in tandem uh, yes. with Pipe Band and uh, you had uh, as, as much a vested interest in your solo piping as what you had in the Pipe uh, Band work. So how did that evolve? Well, when we were, at, we were in Muirheads, we kind of um, we weren't discouraged from playing. In fact, I encouraged Bob being a solo player himself, and he used to talk often about the, you know, the, the Bobby Reed and Gillis and all the players, Malcolm McPherson. So you had this part of Bob that you were getting, so it kind of fired you up, you know. He's telling you about all these great names and Donald McPherson, how he fixed his pipes and one thing or another. So when we would go to the Games, sometimes with the duty band, for example, Newton Moore, we should be up there. And we would always peel off and have a wee go at the, at the, um, at the solos. And they uh, did reasonably, reasonably well, you know. And I didn't play Peebrook at this time. Um, but we also, we used to do the quartet. And one year I had, was asked to do, I took one quartet and Davy Hutton took the quartet. I can only be, I can only be very young, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was at Bella Houston Academy. It was always a great kid. I don't know why they don't do that. Wonderful. It was a fantastic day. A very, very, very high quality of oh. piping. Extremely high quality. Exactly. So there was four of us went on and, and our quartet won it. Mm -hmm. You know? Now I have to say of all my time in the Muirheads, that was one of the one uh, of the high points, you know what I mean? I mean you're up against your Edinburgh police oh, and shots wow. and all these Glasgow police, all the uh. 
top time. So we had we had we had two quartets. I don't know if we we were, we were first night. My quartet was first. I think the other one was third or fourth, and, and I don't know if we made up the other prizes. But anyway, the, the point I'm trying to make this kind of teaching that you got at Muirheads could be applied in quartet piping, and it could be applied in solo piping. Right. And you knew that if you went on to the boards and did what you'd been taught in the band, mm -hmm. uh, milieu as it were, and applied it in the solos, you, you could be successful, you know. And that's what we uh, started to do, and it's picking up e-prizes here and there. And when we were going through in the car, um, Bob used to, used to have copies of Peabrook books lying about, and I used to say, what's all, you know, what's all this, you know. Because we didn't get Peabrook in the BB, they taught us um, how to play croonlows and stuff like that. We learned mm -hmm. that from an early age, and I hardly said, were you interested in that stuff? I went, I very much, you will come up to the house and I'll show you, you know, what to do. So that's what I did, and mm -hmm. I got started. But, started. but again, it was a case of Bob being a great teacher, you know, he wasn't, I wouldn't say he was very good at, he played it and you had to listen and pick it up from that, you know. He was a natural musician who could make music out, open the book and have a look and suddenly it would start to sound pretty good. What was his background? Uh, who taught him Peter? You know? Bobby Reed. Aye, okay. Bobby Reed. Well, Bob, it's a good source there. Well, Bob yeah. Hardy's father was a, was a great man in as much that he understood and appreciated music. Yeah. And he sent... Um, Bob's big friend was Joe Henderson. Uh -huh. A pal of Bob's up in Bishop Briggs was Joe Henderson. Yeah. And that man paid for Joe, who was a good singer, he paid for Joe to go to music singing lessons. Uh -huh. And he paid for Bob to go to piping lessons with Bobby Reed. Uh -huh. And he says, you're a good singer, so you can go and do that. And when you come back, Bob can show you, because there's a piper as well, Joe, Bob can show you everything he's learnt from Reed. And that was the... Mm -hmm. the, the man obviously was a great appreciator, a very appreciative of music, and that's that's how that happened, you know. Aye. And Bob, who I think he started the Boys Brigade up in Bishop Briggs, and uh, they went to Bobby Reed and became a, well a world star, you know, yeah. in, in his own right. He often used to speak about Reed and um, how he played and how kind of much a disciplinarian he was and how he fell out with them at different times, but he he thought he was a wonderful piper. He, he just, he, he, the technique. I remember the, listening to him at Scottish Pipers in the, the old Highlanders Institute on Bank Street on a Saturday night. Uh, Mary's Praise. Uh, uh, I think that was his big tune, you know. Aye. Uh, uh, a wonderful player. Why? Well, he had um, music as well and point aye. and expression. Yeah. But Hardy took that on. Hardy had his own thing too, though, on top aye. of that, you know. He, he was, uh, and Bob Hardy told me he also had lessons from John McCall. Uh -huh. John McCall lived up in Colson in Glasgow near Bishop Briggs. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, the reason I know that was because when I was doing, putting together the Glasgow collection, the book, I went out to, in fact, the guy that lives along the road here was a client of his, was uh, Neil McCall Bell, who was a, the only family member that was still around at that time. This would be in the mid 80s. He lived in Bishopton, so I got the, the bus out to, I drove out, can't remember what, and uh, chapped the door, and the guy came to the door, and I said, I'm Robert Wallace, I'm putting together a book of pipe tunes, I'd like to put Mrs John McCall in the book, but I have to get permission from you to do that, and he says, who are you, where are you at, who's trying, and I said, well, I, I was, I, I ran through, and he went, Bob Hardy, he said, now I remember him calling to my uncle's uh -huh. house, and, uh -huh. uh, or something like that. I, mean, I don't think it was, I think actually it was John McCall's grandson, or maybe it was his son, would that be right? Uh, he would, that would be right, it would be his son, right. I would think, yeah. And um, he, that, that, the guy that lived along here, Jack Robertson, his client was a Neil McCall Bell, and he get, got me the address of John McCall's, it must have been his son, because John McCall died, wasn't he? 1948. Uh -huh. and this wasn't this wasn't a young man in 1980. I mean, he would be in his 70s. There you are. So that would be that would be it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he gave me permission for the tune, and he told me that he remembered 
Bob Hardy coming to his house. Aye. And that maybe would explain why we played so many of McCall's tunes Aye. in the band. Aye. Like Mrs. John McCall, uh -huh. Jeannie Carruthers. Amazing. Uh, you know, Aye. so... Great tunes. Great tunes and, uh, as I say, to get back to Hardy, that would be where his kind of... He had the inherent ability, the great fingers, pipes, ears, the whole thing. So, looking back on it now, your favourite tradition from uh, Bob Hardy, was it good? Well, I think it, was, it wasn't It was as comprehensive as what it needed to be. Did but you have to change the tunes later on no, in life? No, 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 he... he You're he, quite he, happy with... Well, well I, but he, you see, you didn't quite understand. I mean, I was very young, you know, I mean, uh -huh, I was only, I know, you know, six, no, no, 16, it would be 20, early 20s, but, you know, and you weren't getting enough of it and going off enough. He right. would say, right, do this, blah, blah, blah. and then you maybe not see him for three weeks. And they, uh, you lose a bit of pace yeah, there, don't and you? you yeah. just, and I wasn't competing with it, and I tried, and uh, he would give you some, he gave me some tapes and different stuff. I didn't really understand what I was doing. Uh -huh. you know, I really didn't understand what I was doing and uh, it was only when I went to Andrew Wright that I started to get uh, um, a proper kind of understanding and then what Bob had shown me suddenly started to mean something. Aye. That's, so it was a funny kind of way of, of doing things but uh, what was good is that getting a lot of the tunes were from the Bobby Reed style uh, which is slightly different from, although people exaggerate the, the difference, you know. Right. So what Hardy showed me was a lot of different wee things and touches that read like the redundant A's and the two and crew like pausing before cadence E's, like um, not holding on the, 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 the big E notes at the start of some tunes, like the Bells of the Perth, Bells of Perth and getting down to the... You know, all of that, all these wee so-called Cameron touches, and that's really uh -huh. that, you know. Yeah. So I, I got all of that before I went to Andrew, you know. Mm -hmm. So, Andrew, did you compete before you went to Andrew, or did you uh -huh. wait until uh, you No, know, no, I was, I was still going around about 1970, I started going around... Um, I'm talking uh, about fever. Yes, uh -huh. I went in at Enter, but didn't get anywhere, no, no wonder, you know, I really was kind of... Trying to find my But the light music you know. was. Uh, oh, I always did well in the light music. Yeah. That wasn't a problem up to them, as I say, because you just applied what you, you got from Bob and you, uh, you were. So that side of it was okay. That was no problem, you know. The light music was where you were at. The Any major prizes before the Peaver prizes? Uh, really? Yeah, they're talking about light music. I think I got second in the March in the uh, Inverness in 77, and, uh -huh. I, and I won the. The light music at the Scottish Pipers Professional Contest. Uh -huh. um, so I was doing well, and did I get it over before that? I can't remember. But I did well in the, all the light music. I had an Eagle Pipers Contest and at the Edinburgh okay. Police Contest. Yeah. All these kind of usually were pick, picking up prizes, used in bar and stuff like that. Never in the Peebrook though. So, uh, how long were you with Andrew before you started to break through with the Peebrook? Only a couple of years. Right. Really. Oh, because it all kept the light went on, you know. Yeah, yeah. Aye. <laughs> and, um, Did and you build up a large number of tunes with Andrew? Yes, so I went to Andy for on and off, well, seriously for 10 years and then another 10 years kind of more on and off. My ago. goodness, eh? Aye. that's and a long time. Long time and um, the, the important thing was, Alan, was that um, was the amount of tunes, the repertoire. Aye. Aye. You know, and I uh, first uh, heard him playing at uh, Loch Head Games and, uh, and I could hear something in the playing that, um, that I just, I couldn't say, tell you what it was, but I heard something in the playing and I said, that, and I phoned him up and I went up. And within a few months of um, just getting point, no, no, this is pointers here and there, I started to play better, you know. Um, and one thing after two or three years, I was starting to pick up prizes and pay. Like, oh, you know, and then needed to work on the bagpipe, you know. And then once I started getting the bagpipe better, what uh, were you playing at that time? I was playing a set Bob made me, um, Hardy pipes, Hardy uh -huh. pipes, Hardy chanter. I changed to a nail chanter in '79. Took me a whole year to get my ear adjusted 
readjusted because everybody said your chant was too flat. It wasn't so much that, it was a beautiful chant that it played a hardy chant, it was getting reads for it that was difficult. Aye, because it was a long read and read makers weren't making these long they reads. They weren't making them, they stopped it. it the, 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 the read was very long, Aye. I remember that fine because Aye. I played a hardy with the police band of course. And they, and then I returned to normal duties. I had this hardy chanter. I had more or less chucked playing for a yeah. long time, you know. Yeah. And uh, it was just out of the arc. But it was still a beautiful chanter. I know. So was my man. Was you know. see the paper high G on it? Oh, you uh, could. If you get that chanter going, it was great. Ah, you know? yeah, that's right. Aye. But nobody made reads for it. I changed to the nail. And, uh, but the, the, the other thing was the bagpipe. I mean, the bagpipe was. Was a good pipe for the right. for the band. It was right. a lovely sound, but it wasn't solid enough yeah. for long enough for the solo. So I had a lot of trouble with pipes, and um, never quite got the nailed them again. If I had, if I had the pipe I had latterly back then, I'd have done a lot better. And I would say that to anybody starting out, do not be sentimental about your bagpipe. I mean, I held on to that pipe far longer than I should have. It was a good bagpipe, but not for the top level. If you're playing for gold medals, playing for clasps and all the rest of it, you must get the very best instrument. And if it costs you a few pounds to do that, then spend the money. When did you do that? That would, Well, I, I firstly changed them in 87, I think it was. Uh, I bought them, I, I bought a set from a guy playing at, um, uh, what was his name? Bob the Perth. He used to play the dancers at Burnham. I said to him, if you're ever selling your pipes, give me a shout. So sure enough, about five years later, the phone goes, Aye. it's Bob here, I'm selling the pipes. So went up and I bought them and they were good. They were better than the ones I had. What were they? They were Henderson. Uh -huh. Silver and Ivories. But um, they weren't as just the good. You know, and then in 2004, I got the set I competed with in the last few years. And that was, what, if I'd had that pipe Aye. right at the start, Aye. Then you can relax, you see. But all my career I was worrying, 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 are they going to stay, are they going to stay? You're not getting that lockdown, you know. And if you've not got that I lockdown, know. you're never going to be completely relaxed and in total command of what you're doing. You know? I had this uh, set of Henderson's that I bought from a Gurkha Piper in 1964. Made for war 1914 was on the, the base drone, the Royal Scots for war 1914. I'd see these pipes, Ronnie Laurie loved them, you know, right. and um, you just put them up five minutes, that was you, yeah. locked in for a day, and right. and uh, your pipe never let you down on the platform, right. fingers did, frequently, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, yeah. as you say, the bagpipe, you know. Right. And I mean, if you take people to Donald McPherson, <clears throat> wonderful, wonderful instrument, you know, and that was the lodestone of his success. Yeah. Every piper must have that. You've got to have that. And <coughs> don't, do, don't do what I did because Bob had made them and you felt sentimentally attached to them. <coughs> you know, you, you go, oh, you know, you, you've you got to be ruthless. Hugh McInnes used to say that, you know. Got to be ruthless, Scott. Right, yeah, got to be ruthless. Right. And, you know, if it's not right up there, then if they let you down and they're not easy, they should be easy to tune. When you're on that board, that's it. End of story. End of. If you've Aye. got to start plumbing and you're not sure when you step yeah. on that board if they're in the ballpark, if it's not a quarter turn just to relax, settle yourself down, no good enough. No. Not good enough. You must no. get a better instrument than that. That's right. And um, that's what I tell all my pupils now, you know, yeah. very, very strict about that. So, what was the first uh, major medal, uh, gold medal? Well, I, I knew it was on the right tracks with Andrew whenever I, I won the Eagle Pipers Grade 2 competition in 1979, mm -hmm. playing the, the um, Battle of the Pass of Grief. And then I think I got second in the, I think I won a few things other than that, and then I got second in the medal in 83, gold medal at Oban, uh, Inverness in 83, and then I managed to win it at Oban the two years later. Um, what were you playing? I played the King's Taxes. At, at Oman. And, um, Who's judging? Bob Hardy was judging, and, I, and I, I really was kind of upset about that, you know, because I've said people are just going to say I only won this. Andrew Keithley and I think Evan McCray were the other two judges. 
And I always used to say, people are only say I just won that because of <coughs> Bob, Bob judging, you know. Bob wouldn't give me it unless you well, for, And the other two wouldn't have let him away with it. No, no. no and, I, and I have a record. I was pleased with how I played. And, and generally speaking, all Aye. the people who heard, heard me playing were, were very complimentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what pipers are like, you know. But who the hell cares, really, at the end of the day. Um, and that was... That was um, that was quite uh, quite a thrill, you know, because I remember. Well, I mean, you think back, Alan. You know, here you are, a wee tenement boy with the backside hanging out your trousers, you know, and suddenly you're up there winning gold medals. Aye. I mean, no piping history in your family, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, I didn't have an old man handing me a set of, that played by Patrick Ogg and, you know, take me to an uncle that used to be in the Cameron Highlanders and all that kind of background and nothing. We Aye. had nothing, Aye. you know, nothing like that. Aye. And uh, so when I reflected on that at the time, that night, I said, this is, you know, incredible, you, you know. Quite a kick out of that. Yeah, quite a kick out of it. And all credit to, to Andrew and Andrew's teaching. And um, did that put a, extra pressure on you with uh, the clasp tunes, the yes, it light did. music, yes, this and the next thing? Well, the thing about it was that what was important was not just to win prizes. Mm -hmm. I wasn't interested. I wanted to know about the stuff mm -hmm. and know as many tunes as I could. So winning the prizes was wonderful, but not the be all and end all of Kilmore. Mm -hmm. The real and end of Kilmore is to understand the music and as many pieces as 400 and plus tunes. It's a hell of a study, a lifetime study. Mm -hmm. And if you can pick up prizes along the way, wonderful. But to me, there was no sense in this music and just learning a few tunes, winning a medal and then forgetting it. So it was a constant um, sort of um, striving for knowledge. Um, and that one, one thing it did, <laughs> it was the, the following day, I was as high as a kite as you can imagine when you're playing right. the, up, the, up the road and I went on to play in the, uh, I had won the march in 83 I think and, I, and that qualified me for the March of Spain Reel, so I went on to play the big March of Spain Reel outdoors, twice through Edinburgh Police Pipers, Macbeth's of Spain, Pretty Mary in eight parts, twice and I was luckily, lucky enough to win the March of Spain Reel you know, with Donald McPherson second, you know, and things like that. But it was only because I was completely, who cares what happens here? I, I, you know, I, nothing, I, nothing. So you d hit nothing the peak matter. and uh, yeah, everything was, else is just a wee bit. completely uh, relaxed. And uh, sure enough, the, the announcement came out there. One of the thing, well, I have to say that Donald McPherson at the time would be in his late 50s and I'm in my, what, 80, I'm 34. Right. Well, any man at 34 who can't beat a guy in his late 50s, you know. Oh, you're at your physical peak, correct. if you like. I'm Aye. making no claims on that one Aye. whatsoever. Aye. Donald Aye. was at the twilight end of his career Aye. in terms of light music anyway, you know, and he was still playing wonderfully well, of course, you know. But I don't make any great claims. The point I'm trying to make is that you, are, when you're relaxed, and again, it's a lesson for com competing, when you're relaxed, you play so much better. That's how you get relaxed. Though. That's, That's a difficulty. Uh, I, I think uh, if you're competent and in the top of your game, that lets you uh, be relaxed. And uh, part of the tension is where, at the back of your mind, you know that you're not just as competent as what you want to be. Uh, I think that's a big problem that's, right. that's fighting you at the back of your head uh, when you step on that platform. Mm -hmm. And uh, really touching the instrument, if you've got that competent instrument, that's uh, half the battle, you know. So, okay, uh, moving on, uh, before the, the gold medal at Inverness, you had other successes, notable successes, mm -hmm. uh, Peaver Prizes, and if you could just uh, recount some of these for us. Uh -huh. uh, well, I, after the, my first sort of thing was, I said, I said after winning the medal, I was desperate to not to, I was desperate to justify my position. Here I was, you know, suddenly rubbing shoulders with sharing tuning rooms with Donald McPherson and, and Pike Major Angus and, you know, all these, all the great figures. You know, you felt like, what am I doing here, you know? Be, 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 boy, you know, you had to justify your, 
your thing. So you were desperately, you did feel pressure, you know, to, to I did feel pressure, you know, and, and maybe I shouldn't have, you know, because when I hear back some of the things I played, I was playing pretty well, you know, and, uh, you know, whatever. Anyway, after that, I just sort of determined to persevere to try and get the, the other medal at Inverness. And I didn't go in 87 because I couldn't get off work, but um, varying levels of success. I played in the Piper Above All Others competition at City Chambers, which uh, which was, I won that a couple of times, which was good, once with the Lament of the Children and once with Lord, uh, Donald Rugo Mackay and um, very complimentary comments from uh, John McClellan, who was one of the judges, and David Murray was one the, the other year then. Uh, I think went to Glenfiddich and never really played well up there. Never never did myself justice at that competition. I went to London in eighty nine and managed to get the both the major Peter prizes, the the Bradford and the, the Gillis Cup. That's a, a good place too, isn't it? Ah well certainly then it was um you know the Glaciers Hall. Uh -huh. It was a wonderful place to play. Yeah. Um in the in the for the Bradford. Fantastic acoustic. And uh, I think I played um, LSE for salute, yeah. LSE for salute. Then went upstairs and played the Park Peter number two for the Gillis Cup, and was lucky enough to get the two of them. And was that unusual? Well, it was the first time since Bob Brown, I think, in '64, had won the the double. You know, so in, you know, it hadn't done for twenty five years up to that point. So I was quite chuffed about that one. You know, uh -huh. you've got to take these successes when they come out. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's plenty if of you're days. You're on a run, away you go. <laughs> there's plenty of days when you're away aiming with nothing. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was quite good, and uh, I just kept competing and trying to improve the bagpipe, but um, never quite having that completely relaxed thing about the pipes that I, I always knew I should have, you know, but um, and I had a success at Inverness, all the prizes except the Lincoln one I wanted, which was the first prize and I but of course I was diluting my effort because I was always learning the tunes for the class, the, the senior Peabrook right. and for the medal. That's a big, big task. Yes, so you were, yeah. sometimes you were learning seven, eight tunes. Uh -huh. uh, okay, luckily some years you knew them already from before, but by and large you were keeping ten, eight to ten tunes on the go, plus your sky tunes, which had to be McCrimmon tunes, you know. So and light music. And, and your light music as well, you know. So mm -hmm. when you're trying to hold down a job as I was, at the, I'm not making it's, everybody's in the same boat here, by the way, don't get me wrong. Anybody playing at a professional level has got the same thing, you know, so it, it, it definitely dilutes your effort, you know. So getting the two medals early in your career is great because it means you can then focus on the senior events. Yes. When you have your effort split over the gold medal and the senior events, you're always going to have that wee bit more difficulty. However, the great upshot uh, upside of that is your repertoire. And oh, going, going back to what I said aye. earlier mm -hmm. about forcing you to learn all these different pieces. Aye. So for nine, ten years, I'm struggling to get this second medal, but all that time I'm learning. You're building. Correct. Aye. So you're building up this knowledge base. Aye. You maybe don't realise it at the time and you find it's a bit of a, you know. But anyway, that, that was the, the upside of it. At the time, when you're getting seconds and thirds and fourths and stuff like that, and you're going, oh, what have I got to do? And I realised that um, most of the time I was beating myself because I was putting extra pressure on myself to get this. And I said, this, there's something fundamentally wrong about your approach here. Right. And uh, the year I did get it in 95, I, I said, right, I'm not going to play in the senior events. So mm -hmm. I didn't play, so I didn't practice for the class, for example, and the senior people at Owen. I only focused on getting the medal tunes up to speed. Uh, the class tunes, rather, the senior people tunes up to speed. And on the day, um, I didn't go near the competition. I went for, a, I drove up on the morning because I had a latish draw. And I uh, went for a rather expensive lunch. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> and we won't go into too much about that. But uh, suffice to say, I, I didn't hold back on the 
whatever it was, the Chateau Neuf or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, so I arrived at Eden Court completely mm -hmm. relaxed and um, ready to give it my, my best shot. I took the pipes out of the box. The guy said, when you're on in your room, you get a room in 10 minutes. Took the pipes out of the box, blew them up, played for 10 minutes, went far away, told my tune, the blue ribbon, and went down, played. Pretty happy, got through cleanly because up to that point I was making mistakes because of the pressure and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Pipes seemed to hold up quite well. But I was working the next day, back in the car, away home. By the time I got home, there was a message in the answer machine saying that I'd won the gold medal. Great stuff. You know, Who that, told you? Murray Henderson. Ah, he left a message on ah, the machine to ah, say that I, had, that, I had, that I had done it, you know. Ah. And um, so it was quite pleasing to get that one. So who was judging that case? I, oh, now you're asking. Oh, I think Jack Taylor was one of the judges. I think Malcolm McCray was, was one too. Uh -huh. And, uh, God, who the hell is that other one? I can't remember. I can't remember. It might have been. Is it Norman Matheson? I don't think so. Uh, they, I think the two, those two were definitely on the bench that day. Right, anyway, yeah, you know, yeah. So that right. one of the one of the few decisions they did get right. <laughs> Great stuff. So that was That's wonderful. Sort of, right. was good right. to get that out of the way, you know. And uh, you done you did other successes at Sky as well. Aye, the following year went up to Sky and uh, and Sky was a unique competition, you know, it's always, mm -hmm. obviously it's my crimin tunes and again I've never really played the Dunbegging medal many times but never really delivered the goods, never delivered the goods, you know, I just I don't know the weather, the damp, I tried too hard. It's not a great place to play, is it? Playing, uh, playing uh, too you're much. Doing church halls and all that. Yeah, and that's the that's training that's facilities. Are but again, or... everybody's in the same boat. Aye, I mean, but you know, it still doesn't align to the, the best performance. No, it doesn't. So. I don't know, the last since I've been up, but it might have been better now, but anyway, I went up and uh, played the uh, Lament for the Children in the Dunbegin medal mm -hmm. and managed to get, get lucky there and um, the at night, at Sky, if you win the medal, you get playing, you don't need to wait till the next year, you get playing at night, so I made sure I had tunes that were all suitable because it's a slightly more demanding list for the it class. Is, uh, for the evening. Yeah, yeah. but mm -hmm. I had made sure that the ones I put in for the Denvegan medal would all have Aye. did for uh, did for the, would all have done for the um so it's 12 or 14 McCrimmon tunes and then there's about 6 out of that 12 or 14 <laughs> are the, the yeah. harder tunes that, that for That's the right. Yeah. And again I went up and uh, was in the church at night, it was packed and I got Donald Doyle Mackay to play and uh, I think it was one of the few times where I came off feeling that, that um, you know, I'd actually been able to put my, my heart and soul into the thing, pipe just sat, you know. And um, whenever you get that, you know, you, you never for, you never forget it in people. People always ask you, what is the thing about people? But see if you produce a good performance in people, because what do you all your life? Aye, you aye. never forget it. Yeah. Might be the same in Master Spaniel, but I've done that too. It's never got the same profound effect on you that a good performance of a good people has. You never forget aye. it. And um, I, I always remember that performance of Donald Doolittle. I had to nurse the F. Um, watch my blowing on the F all the way through but um, I was luckily luckily got that so that was that was quite good. What know. top hand uh, work in oh, that yes. aye, aye, aye. Aye. But aye. a great piece for for nuanced you know for nuanced expression. Yeah. It's um, very good for that, you know. I think we'll move on now. Uh the you've touched on it how you, your work in pins and your piping and it's maybe time to discuss the exact nature of your work. What was your professional background? Well, I was a journalist to, to trade, or I am a journalist to trade and uh, started off the weekly papers, started off as a copy boy, the Daily Record in Glasgow and then worked my way up on to, the, to getting a job as a reporter uh, in the weekly papers and uh, was out you know, all over central Scotland and uh, this would be, joined the record in 69 as a copy boy and then they sent us to college and stuff to learn about shorthand and politics and one thing or another and um, after 
that, got back in to join the Evening Times and I was there for years. And the reason I stayed there was because you got Saturdays off and you could get the piping, mm -hmm. you know, and you could get the, well, our day was very early morning, start, I mean, I was in, started at seven and stuff like that, and you were, but you were finished by you know, late afternoon, mid to late afternoon, whereas the morning papers, it's all back shift evening work. Aye, so to it, feed in to the next morning. Correct, yeah. so it would have been pinched seriously on the piping, so I never, so I suppose in a way it kind of held back the, 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 the newspaper career because there were opportunities that I didn't take that I could have taken for promotion one thing or another Aye. but I did quite uh, reasonably well at the at the papers and ended up news editor at the at the Evening Times and then I went to Daily Record for a while and uh, Was it general news? Yeah, or? yeah, general news reporting but when you're news editor you're, 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 you're meeting and you have to deal with all sorts of different uh, um, aspects of news, you know, and uh, characters and individuals and deadlines and one thing. Wonderful, wonderful life. <laughs> um, but I think it was uh, uh, the, the reputation, the same as the police at that time, had, had taken a, a few drums when they were working. Well, I think most of the friends or most of the people that were all dead. Right. Yeah, with booze and fags and stuff. I mean, this was the day of the hard bitten reporter sitting with the twenty pack and the, Aye. and you know, and then the minute the story's written down to the pub, the Aye. day, you know, let's not romantic over romanticise no, no. these days no. because, but there certainly was an element of excitement and an, an element of um, uh, what would you say? a brio about the whole thing that you just don't seem to see or envy in the business. I still talk to these guys and obviously and they tell you that it's all completely different now, you know. And, uh, but these were, this was the days before. This but the whole nature of society has changed accordingly. Well, it has. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. society in general was like that. Uh, and, uh, but uh, society has changed. Oh, uh, yeah. uh -huh. and, but, but the thing about it is that there's an honesty about it, you know, uh -huh. there's an honesty about it, you know, and you, you, you did something, and that was it, and uh, um, it was like, you I mean, for example, today you can Google something on the computer, find mm -hmm. out the information, well, these days you had to go and actually physically get, uh, yeah. get through the, you had to you go to a library, pull right, a book, do the legwork, uh, you know, uh, do the legwork, do the research, yeah. and that's fantastic training that, you know, uh, do the research, don't just try and bullshit your way through something, learn about it. If you're going to write about it, learn about it, you know. Aye, this aye. is something I tried to apply, obviously, in the... In the, the piping? Yes, of course, aye, you know. Aye. And uh, so, uh, the, the journalism was a, was a was my career. Uh -huh. It was my um, the bread and butter, as it were. Well-paid work, well-paid job, and uh, very interesting, fascinating, some of the biggest dealing with things like the Lockerbie disaster and Piper Alpha and of course multifarious Glasgow murders and <laughs> and all the characters. Well I was uh, around yeah, the murder same. scene at that time. Yeah, uh, that that was what I was into yeah. in the seventies and eighties. Oh uh, uh, in the centre of Glasgow as a DS uh, yeah. in the central division of Glasgow and that was meet and drink to meet and drink, yeah. Aye, aye, aye. So every day I mean great great times and you know, we used to tune into the police radio aye. illegally, oh, and you knew the codes. Aye. So you would often get to the get to the the, the scene before the cops and got it. You know? And code one was a was an armed armed robbery, shots fired. Code two was a you know armed robbery, but no shots fired. Oh, the, these shots getting fired made a big difference, you know. But the twenty one red was the one everybody went to cop and bother. What was that? Was it? Aye, aye. Was, aye? aye. Oh uh, aye, the Allison Street siege and the uh, Ibrox disaster just caught the tail end of that and all these kind of big, big uh, events, you know. Interesting life, really. Oh aye, aye. Folk groups, traditional yeah. folk music, how did you get into that scene? Well, in the Muirheads band, uh, one of the pipers was Jimmy Anderson and Jimmy played with, um, was a, he a, he's a good guitar player, Jimmy, he was always interested in the folk scene, he played with a group called the Cluther. And uh, they were um, a singing group basically, but they had a couple of fiddles and they were experimenting with trying to become more instrumental. They had a concertina, two fiddles, and they had Jimmy on the miniature pipes. 
and uh, it was it was okay, and nice enough, but the, the miniature pipes are kind of not quite the no. the thing. But anyway, Jimmy was a joiner. He was always hurting his hands and damaging his fingers, and one thing or another. So I was quite pally with him. So one night he said to me, "I've got this gig. Can you come in? I can't go. So could you do it for me?" So I, I ended up standing in every time he had his fingers with a hammer <laughs> or a saw or whatever. I was the standing. So. Got to know another group called the Whistle Binkies and they fancied having a pipe as well. And these days there were no pipers in, in Scottish folk groups, you know. So I did what I copied Jimmy, I got a set of miniature pipes and uh, so we did a few collective numbers with the group and then we'd come on with the big pipes at some some point as well, did a wee selection. But it never really was properly proper integration, as it were. After a while the Whistle Binkies asked me to join the group, which I did. And um, we started doing research into uh, an instrument that would be more suitable for playing with the, the group with the projection and one thing or another. And the book Francis Collinson's book, The Traditional National Music of Scotland, which is a bit about lowland pipes, bellows pipes. And I said, Christ, if I could get a set of them. Well, these days we had the Northumbrian pipes, uh -huh. and I think there was a couple of people playing loan pipes, but I didn't know anything about them or anything of them. But we were up in Inverness doing a gig and went into the museum there, and they had drawings of loan pipes and all sorts of different pipes. So the guy there, he did a copy of these drawings and brought them back to Glasgow. And Ian MacDonald of the Neilston Band, his father-in-law worked in the Rolls Royce, mm -hmm. so he turned me out a barrel stock. So the drones. Ah, the common stock. Common yeah. stock. And I uh, measured up the drones and I had a set of, I bought a set of half, a half set of pipes from mm -hmm. Archie Osborne up in Creef. And lo and behold, the measurements of this half set were absolutely spot on for the lowland pipes. Mm -hmm. So I stuck three reeds in the, in the, uh, the, the stock. McDougall, uh, the McDougall half set actually, uh -huh. from Archie. Put them in the common stock, then we up and got a set of Northumbrian bellows and started trying to learn to, to do the bellows thing. And it worked. The three drones, I could tune them in, they bothered, they were as steady as a rock. And I said, well, I just need to get the chanter going now. So the chanter again was the same dimensions as the lowland pipe chanter. Didn't have the keys that some of them had for the extra, well, they pinched it for the extra notes, so they say, but anyway, it was a simple chanter conical bore, very easy pipe read, big one like you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, big pipe read and put it in and it was hellish. But it was because it was I was pitching it to the wrong key. Mm -hmm. So I did some work with some tape, sinking the read, blah 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 blah, eventually got it pitching perfectly in B flat. Right. And I then sorted the drones to go in. And that was me off and running. I said, this should be much more difficult than what it is. And that's when I thought that I must be on the right lines here because if this wasn't right, it wouldn't be working. Right. So I just worked away at, the, at getting this thing and it was a good bit quieter, obviously, than the Highland Pipes. Plus I was getting the projection that you, you got from the Highland Pipes, but at much lower volume. So I took this kind of hybrid lowland pipe thing along to the practice and luckily the musicians in the Whistle Binkies were first class musicians and they could play up. Fiddlers could finger up in B flat, mm -hmm. or they could they could tune up, of course, to do it. But they could also finger up. Eddie, the flute player, he could finger in B flat. So we got enough numbers together to combine pipes, flute, fiddle, concertina, mm -hmm. and the class sach is in E flat anyway. So it was no bother. So there we had the sound of the whistle binkies born out of that, and uh, we just worked at that and developed it as the years went on and luckily Eddie being one of Scotland's top composers he was able to arrange the music properly for 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 um, for pipes, fiddle, flute. What type of music were you playing? Was it Scottish or? Yeah so I was Scottish I but up to that point before the pipes came in the whistle winkers were more doing bluegrass and Irish kind of stuff yeah, you yeah. know that kind of stuff which was the, the Dubliners type thing but the big influence that was coming in at that point in 74 was um, the Chieftains you know we our idea was if we could get a Scottish group doing what the Chieftains does 
then that would be tremendously successful and it was pretty successful. We got a record contract with Cladder Records in Dublin and we made a whole host of records and that's 40 odd years now we've been going and still playing, we're doing a gig on next week. You're still playing well? Yeah, and we, last year we got inducted into the, <laughs> the Hall of Fame, the, uh -huh. the Traditional Music Hall of Fame, so that was quite good. But what's most pleasing about it, Alan, is to see that today the pipes have been accepted in the folk music scene. Yeah. Whereas people have to understand back then, you know, there was the, the box and fiddle clubs, there was the piping and pipe bands, yeah. there was a the classic society, you know, and that was it, and there the twain shall, there the three shall, shall meet sort of Aye. thing. And we like to think... Is there a lot more instrumental uh, music played by these groups now, uh, rather than uh, the ballads of here yeah. before? Yeah, uh, I or think is there still right. that big mix? Uh, what, what's no, that? I think there's more, there's certainly more instrumental groups now, you know. Aye. Um, some of the stuff they're playing leaves to me is pretty heavy going, but that's fine, you know, I'm probably Aye. too old to appreciate it. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, there are more groups playing, and there's some fantastic playing uh, in these groups. Aye. Wonderful pipers and... Uh, um, you know, guys like Gordon Duncan and yeah. people like that took it all on to another level. But the but the the freedom that the folk scene piping gave to pipers is what spawned all of that. You yes. know, right. and um, Jimmy. There's no restrictions. No, then. no restrictions. So and, and there were no restrictions in terms of false fingers and right. things like that. And I say this to people all the time. People ask me why mm. I do it. Why I do it. I always mean I always said that I would only ever do it. If I could keep the serious stuff going as well, because I didn't want to be branded a kitchen piper. Aye. And there's nothing wrong with kitchen piping. No. Provided if you've got the talent and the ability, you maximise that. And what, what I hate to see more than anything is a young, skilled pipers who should be playing at the top table of piping, in other words, in the solo world. Yes. And they turn their talents to the folk groups. There's no reason in the world why they can't do both, and they should be able to do both. So who's steering them that way? Ugh, it's maybe just fashion, it's maybe just some nonsense they get about how the solo world is um, all very restrictive and it's all organised by the army and the Peaver Society and it's all very kind of close this and you're not allowed to do uh, that, you're uh, not allowed to express yourself. That is the biggest heap of nonsense that you're ever likely to hear in piping. Because are you telling me that Donald McPherson didn't express himself for uh, Bobby Reid or Bob Hardy or John Burgess or all of these great players felt restricted on the boards? Uh, you know, it's a lifetime study even to get up there and get a prize is a wonderful achievement. Yes, absolutely. And you do not achieve it by, you know, being restricted in what you're doing you achieve it by being able to have a wonderful pipe wonderful fingers wonderful music that's and the highest platform that we have in piping is the solo piping platform and for bands the solo piping uh, the, sorry the band circle but i mean we can't they're not mutually exclusive there's no reason why you can't play bands you can't play solos you can't play in folk groups provided you understand the parameters that each requires and one's not superior or inferior to the other you know because you can fill a hall in a folk group playing pipes doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't be able to go up if you're any good right. and, and, and hold an audience in a solo competition you, and because you can't do it or don't do it you yeah. don't demean it because of that by saying yeah. you know, it's all restricted I don't like I like to go out and do my own thing you know I'm going to touch now on your time with the College of Piping. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Well, I had my own uh, magazine. The, when I left the newspapers, I started my own. I was doing some freelance work and I always had the idea of doing my own magazine. So I started a magazine called the Piper Press, which is the paper version of what I'm, I'm doing now, the Piping Press. And uh, I started the magazine and uh, I just got a phone call. Chavis McNeil had died. Piping Times was, well, we won't go into what state it was in, or whatever, and I got a call the, to, <clears throat> they would buy me out, buy out the pipe profess when I come and edit the Piping Times and become principal of the College of Piping, so 
at that time it suited me to do that and yeah, we did that. Um, when was that? That would be 99. Okay. 1999. And uh, when I went there, the, it was a sorry state of affairs. I would say that the college at that point was hanging by a thread. Mm -hmm. um, they had money, they had goodwill, <coughs> a certain amount of money and a certain amount of goodwill around the world, but the building was falling apart. The um, Pipe and Times was, from a journalistic point of view, um, well, at a low level, let's say. Uh, the tutor books were all out of date. You know, the whole, whole <laughs> was in a pretty sorry state. So a number of years of work there and uh, eventually managed to get the building uh, rebuilt in 2003 and then the extension, the lecture hall at the back. Yeah. And uh, then the, the Pipe and Times underwent a whole series of improvements and we managed to be nominated for, um, highly commended in the magazine, the Scottish Magazine Awards in 2005, which was for a wee magazine like the Pipe and Times, which is a nice thing to have. And uh, the tutor books, I read it all the tutor books and many other books as well for the college. And uh, yeah, I look back with pride on what I achieved there. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the, the time just flew in. Uh, how long were you there then? I was there for 15 years. 15 years, 15 my years, goodness. Uh, just a blink of an eye, really. Really, I, it, it went in very quickly. But when you're working every month, Alan, uh, trying to produce a magazine, a, a quality magazine with uh, quality writing in it, uh -huh. and I always used to say this to them that, uh, you know, the easiest thing in the world is to fill a magazine mm -hmm. with just shovel it in and out you go, you uh -huh. know. But to do it to a decent level is not easy. It's a professional requirement. You need did, to, uh, did you find the editorial that was uh, the most difficult because you had to have something fresh to say every yes, month? Yes, of course it is. Aye. Every month you have to find something to say, something hopefully intelligent, something thought-provoking, mm -hmm. something that would pe put people to account. Mm. Something that would tell the truth, and uh, something you know that other people found that they, you know, it's all behind an envelope. Oh, whisper, 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 you know. And but you get that, you know. You have to have <coughs> journalists get a bad name, but you have to have the strength and the knowledge and the ability mm -hmm. to tell it as it is and be prepared to take the flak. Right. So long as you give people the right of reply, mm -hmm. then. You're doing your job then. You're doing your job. And piping needs that. You know, there's too much uh, idle chit chat behind, you know, in the beer tent and, you know, not enough people prepared to stand up and be counted. So you use uh, the platform of uh, the College of Piping and uh, you went out into Glasgow, uh, the general piping scene there. Uh, can you recall any projects that you became involved in, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, pipe band scene or solid pipe uh, that day? Uh, well, I mean, I, I was particularly proud of raising the money and all the rest of it to rebuild the College of Piping, you know, I mean, and things like that. I mean, my predecessor there, not the one, but two before me, Seamus McNeil. I mean, mm -hmm. Seamus McNeil had no time for me whatsoever. Mm -hmm. and the guy couldn't stand the sight of me. Mm -hmm. It was somewhat... Ironic that here was I working to save the place that he had started up, started, you know. He couldn't stand me because uh, I played in folk groups. He had no time for that, you know. Right. Plenty of time for pipe bands. The only thing he was interested in was Peabrook and two, four marches. But <laughs> anyway, let's not go down that road. But to, anyway, there was some irony in, in it as much. Here was I sitting in a Tago Street trying to raise the money, organising the architects and all the rest of it to get the place built. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I mean, what I had inherited was a hovel. I mean, mm -hmm. It was a hovel. I mean, I was sitting there one day at the on the laptop, and the rain was pouring in down my, my neck, <laughs> down the back of my neck. You know. Yeah. And um, so there was a certain irony in in turning it round. In terms of the magazine, what was important for the magazine was that it was seen as something worth reading every month. You know. And you get involved in the World Pipe Band Championships being televised? Yes, well, we very early on, I mean, I, I, it's always annoyed me that the way the media has treated 
fighter. The, the print media uh, wrote many letters to the Glasgow Herald and to the Scotsman about their coverage, which was just pathetic. We were always taken as kind of joke music, you know. We were never treated seriously, you know. And um, I always was very vocal about that and castigating them whenever they... Um, and the BBC about their non-coverage of, of piping. So we started a petition mm -hmm. and I went up to see the guy and he was very nice. Um, he had me in and he said, oh, we're worried about the viewing figures. I said, look, I guarantee, I said, apart from anything else, I said, as a public service broadcaster, that shouldn't be an into, a, a, a worry to you. Mm -hmm. I said, this is Scotland, your duty is to reflect the music in Scotland. Whether it gets two people watching it, or ten people watching it, or ten thousand watching it. But I can, okay, well, we, we know the current kind of um, policy of the BBC these days. But I said, I guarantee you this. I said, you'll be amazed at the readers, uh, the viewers that you get for this, if you put the thing on. I went, oh, oh. So eventually, they decided to do it. Now, there was pressure at the time from RSPBA, Mervyn Heron was, was on them because they'd done it in Northern Ireland mm -hmm. and been successful getting Ulster TV to do it right. over there. Yeah, so much. there was a kind of twin pronged thing. I got this petition through the pipe in time, we got three and a half thousand names. I went up to, I can't remember the guy's name, is it Ian? I can't remember his name, an awful nice guy. And I presented him, look, all right, okay, for the four. <laughs> so we did the four, got handing over the petition. And sure enough, they televised it. And um, the uh, the things just it's been a big success. Fantastic success, and they now yeah. get dispensation from the governors in London to uh, live stream it yeah. uh, on the internet. You know, right. so it's been a wonderful thing for Scotland, right. and I like to think that the it's pipe a big, big thing for the city as well. Fantastic, right. and I like to think that um, the pipe and times under my um, editorship played a part in that. You know, so is there any other? Projects like piping live, do you much to do with piping no, live? No, no, nothing really to do with piping live. That was uh, Roddy, the piping centre's uh -huh. idea, really. And they wanted us to become involved in that at the college, but I wasn't prepared to get involved in it directly unless we had a place on the committee mm -hmm. for the for the thing, and they weren't prepared to do that. So it's done well, it's gone on to, to be very successful. And we, and at the college, we played a small part and put on their own um, shows that were in, uh, involved in that. But there was one other um, campaign which was to save, save the, the Strathclyde Police by right. band, which was under serious right. threat, which I know is a, a matter dear to your heart, Alan. So whenever they, they had all the hassle with getting moved out of A Division and one thing or another... 2008, 2009, 2008 right. We started the petition to save Strathclyde Police and we went up to Pitch Street with a <laughs> thing. I don't think I was terribly popular with Mr. House at the time, but um, I had the national press there and one thing and another, and uh, that was good. But that again, you see, it's being prepared to put your neck on the line for yeah. something that you believe in, and I think you have to do that. Yeah. If you if you you know if you're a journalist of any metal at all, you have got to stand. You know you you can't. Um, uh, just sort of go and hide away and let these things fade. Well, let it fade, Strathclyde, please, without a band. After all the years uh, of whatever. So your time came to an end at the College of Piping. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that come about? What was going through your mind there? Well, I mean, I'd probably best not to go into the, the, that in too much detail, Alan. But what I would say to people, to anybody, is when you have a situation where people um, in, a, in a boat on a board have less knowledge, less experience, less ability, and who have done very little and, to, to, and nothing in, in the piping world, and they can start interfering with what you're doing, then it's time to go. Right. And I think that says it all. Uh, you've left the college, uh, you're penniless and you're needing <laughs> a wage and all that sort of stuff. Uh -huh. hey, anyway. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I always, um, you know, I mean, this is, this is another thing that you, you see, you know, a number of decent, very good pupils 
over the years brought to the college for me principally, you know, and last year was a, was a particularly, um, a, what would you say, satisfying year when you see one of your students, like Douglas Murray, getting both the gold medals and another one of Bill Geddes has been come to for many years getting second in the in the medal and you know so you so you've got all of that kind of um, success if you like from a teaching basis so I mean I was firstly I was not going to give up the teaching that's for sure so there was that aspect of it so I'm still doing the teaching and I've been in writing to newspaper journalism piping journalism for many many years before the Pine Times, I had my own magazine, Piper Press. Before that, I did articles for the West Highland Free Press, and I did the occasional article for the Herald, and so I've been kind of writing all my uh, days. So that wasn't going to stop. So the outlet for it, the obvious vehicle for it, was the internet, and uh, Scotland needed a good web-based magazine, mm -hmm. you know, and um, there was a niche there for it. There's no question about it. And um, it's only been going now for what five months or so. Last started it last August, so it's been very successful, and, and hundreds of readers every day, and thousands every week, and uh, all over the world. So it's hard work, but it's enjoyable, and I think it's fulfilling a need. And I've got plans to develop that as as we go. And it seems to be developing all the time organically. It's just yeah. the, uh, your, your teaching. Uh, you're providing news and the uh, colour to the general back, back, uh, uh, oh, background scene of uh, bagpiping, yeah. but also you've got sales. Yes, I've got a wee shop. Well, the thing is, it doesn't make money, but I mean, the, the odd sales that we get right. help offset the cost of, of doing this. Provides thing. an interest and as well. Provides an interest as well, and it might um, it might generate a few few pounds. You, you know, a few years down the line or whatever. Right, right. But I mean, like all of these things, Alan, I mean, you're actually, you know, you've had so much pleasure out of piping. You're doing the same yourself of this series yeah. that you do. You've had so much pleasure out of it and it's been so much a part of your life that you do feel that you should put something back into it. And if, if that contribution that you could make is in informing people, educating people, um, entertaining people, then yeah, I think you should keep doing it, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any reason to stop. And if you get that opportunity. Um, I mean, another thing that, that's been, that, I, I've, that we did with Norm, I did with Norman Matheson, who I know you've interviewed, was a Masters of Pembroke series yes, of 10 CDs, which were very successful. And that's again in the same line. You, you're helping put out back into the piping things that you got out of it yourself. Right, the knowledge the back knowledge, into yeah, circulation. Yeah, and, yeah. and um, you know, I learned a tremendous amount from doing these CDs, listening to Bob Brown and Bob yeah. people learn, having to you know, edit these things along with Norman. And uh, he deserves great credit for right. for um, for taking the machine back in the 70s and recording. Uh, people Bob. want to see that interview can turn up their Boyne 3 uh, piping a boy in whatever heading is, uh, look for a boy and then you'll get uh, Norman and uh, Jack and uh, their, uh, their chap, um, is Duncan it? Watson. Duncan. I keep on thinking Brian Watson for yeah. some reason. Duncan, yeah. who is a uh, good fun. Uh, what I'm trying to cover lastly is uh, your general activities in uh, piping now. Uh, Okay, you've got the, the Piper's Press, but I'm just talking a more a uh, general nature. Uh, Peabrook Society. Uh -huh. Well, I continue to be active in the music committee and uh, as vice president of the Peabrook Society. Yeah. And uh, I remember first going to the society, it must have been John McFadden that actually encouraged me to go to the society all these years ago. Aye. Uh, in 19, I think the first time I went was 76 to Middleton Hall. I've been a member ever since and uh, I think the society does great work and um, again all volunteers putting back in stuff that they, you know, into the thing that they, after a lifetime of taking from piping, here they are going along and we go along for meetings and we work in the books and one thing or another. So I, I think the society is a, a great uh, society to support and I'd encourage all the, the, the readers and, and viewers. And book 16 to come out? Book 16, um, should be possibly this year. 
Right. Possibly this year, you know. It's and the uh, annual conferences and in the March. Conferences in, it's every March and it's open to everyone. You can come along as a day visitor and there's always something worthwhile. But there's a very friendly... It's in Burnham. Uh, it's at Burnham. Uh, probably will be for the foreseeable future, Alan. And um, it's always a very fraternal weekend and very nice people. And uh -huh. I mean, when I first went to the thing, again, you know, you feel a bit... It's different in these days, it might have been a bit stuffier and all the rest of it, but you know, you just have to say to yourself, well, these are people who are putting money into the music and um, it's worthwhile music right. and um, so for all their ears and graces, at least they're doing something, you know. And that has led you into judging, hasn't it? Well, indirectly, when you stop coming. When you stop competing, you you tend to gravitate towards it. Yeah, you, you again you you like to do a bit. So teaching and uh, judging are your two avenues. Uh, they can that can be a bit of a conflict at times because a lot of people say, um, you know, if you're teaching, then you you should be judging, you know. But I don't hold to that view. It's, it's this old Scottish thing. Uh, yeah, it's a terrible it's a uh, terrible scenario, you know uh, that. Um, you, if you've got a pupil and you're in a bench of three people, then if you don't trust the... The honesty. Uh, uh, aye. And, and any experience I've had, people, the judges follow them backwards to to make it clear that they're not promoting their pupils and that kind of I mean, I think the bands have got it, they've got it right when they've got this monitoring system whereby anybody that's prejudiced towards a it soon shows up in the figures. Of course it does. And um, the same would happen in the solo piping, you Aye. know. So rather than exp uh, um, rather than sort of prejudge it Aye. and say there's an issue here, let people judge what they get asked to judge. And then if there's a pattern develops, you can then say, well, wait a minute, this guy's a wee bit... Don't anticipate problems that are not there. Absolutely. That's a better way of putting it out. Yeah. Don't anticipate problems that are not there. Well, I'm afraid that yeah. uh, this anticipation is there. Yeah. And, it, and, and it's not right. It's not right at all. Really. It's almost a jealousy, I think, you know. Ah, they, it's, they, it's not right. But the, the problem with it is... The, the, I mean, I've had senior, a senior player tell me that he's not teaching because he wants to judge. Now, whenever you get that, that is a disaster for piping right. because these are the most knowledgeable people who have been at the top level. Right. The, the, you know, judging and teaching are not oil and water. They must be, you, you do not want all the people with no pupils judging the top competitions. I always think there should be a reluctance eh, to be a judge, eh, to be a successful judge. You don't really want to do it. It's always you, you, you anybody that's dying to be a judge, I, I, I don't know there's a wee bit of... Uh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would worry there, you know, definitely. Uh, what, what the ambition is. Yes, absolutely. Know. I mean, yeah. and see this in these, this day and age as well, with internet and all the rest of it, Aye. and people recording oh. surreptitiously. There's no hiding place. You're, you're not going away with it. If anything like that was going on, Aye. for goodness sake, it would last two minutes, you know. Aye. So uh, the whole problem is exaggerated beyond, uh, far, far beyond what it actually is. And um, I'm going to take you uh, around in the, the big circle where we started, back to the pipe band scene. Yeah. Uh, you started with the 214 BB and uh, you were really right into the band scene long before uh, you get the big successes with the solo piping. So uh, it's back there, you've never judged uh, and you haven't become involved in the judging, but you're quite an avid uh, commentator, <laughs> shall we say, on a uh, pipe band uh, competitions. Aye. Uh -huh. uh, push well, your outlook there. Well, I mean, it's, um, you know, the, the firstly, if I was to do the judging thing for the RSPB, obviously you couldn't do the, 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 the journalism, you couldn't be writing about the thing, you know. But pipe bands are one of the greatest, sort of, as Tommy Miller in Northern Ireland says, it's the, the greatest sound in the world, you know. And he's, he's got something there. I mean, the pipe band world, I mean, for all you talk about solo piping and people for the rest of it, I mean, you can take the pipe band scene, the, the, the P-Rock and solo pipe scene is a very, very small percentage in relation to the pipe bands. Right. Pipe bands are where 
is the global thousands and thousands of people who never play solo or whatever. You know, so pipe bands are, are very, very important for manufacturers. They're very important for the whole business. And the solo piping is wonderful. The members of the public are attracted to the pipe band. The pipe band, well, yeah. exactly. You know, the tattoo, yeah. the big concerts, the mass bands. It's got all of that. You know? I've seen you, uh, your writings on first grade pipe band and uh, you don't just confine your comments to the piping but also to drumming and ensemble. Where did you pick up these points? I just go by what I hear, Alan. I don't right. pick up anything. I mean, I've never been at any of these courses or anything like that. Uh -huh. But look, it's simple. It's a pipe band, right? right? But what sound? It's got to be quality sound. Now, invariably, I, I will always try to put this caveat or anything all right. I'm up in the stand. Right. Judges are down on that part much closer. They can hear things that right. bit better. Although Alistair Aiken's got a point when he says the ensemble judge should be on a cherry picker above the band. He shouldn't be down because then you get the global picture. Yeah. So from a global perspective, if you're sitting side on to the band, the drums are there, the pipes are there, and you're kind of there up on a stand, in some ways, from an ensemble perspective, you're getting the, 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 the big picture of the thing. You know, so um, from piping, a piping perspective, okay, I'm a piper, so you're obviously going to look at it through the prism of the bagpipe. But it is a pipe band. Mm -hmm. You're wanting that quality of sound. And if the sound's not there and it's not sustained, you're going to hear it. Then the precision in the technique, right. and this is what the top bands have got. I mean, you hear the field marshals' technique. You can you can tell they're working at their doublings. Right. You can tell they're working at every grace note, being pin sharp and together. Right. You can hear it. And then when you hear, you know, the sympathetic drum sounds like you get from. Gordon Brown at the at the Bog Hall yeah. and that kind of mellower tone he gets. Well, to my ear, that all yeah. adds to the mix and uh, gives you this perfect kind of pipe band. So you develop favourites, you develop uh, preferences. Right. That's natural. But the beauty is in the eye of the beholder in every yeah. form of art, and uh, that's but it. I have the yeah. you know say some you know there's not enough right. people putting their thoughts on paper there's not enough people right. prepared you know you, and you, you, sort of, you get it and, the, and this is the one thing i hate about the bbc coverage right. there's no um subjectivity about it there's no there's nobody saying it's quite well, anodyne really, like isn't that. it it's right? all kind of typical bbc blue peter everybody's wonderful and it's fantastic you know well any other artistic walk of life right. There's guys in there saying, pile of bricks, rubbish, you know. Aye. There's, there's, there's guys up there giving their own view on the thing. Uh -huh. I don't even agree with it, but the art moves on because of it. And it's one thing that's missing from our piping world is there are not enough people prepared to stand up and be counted and say what they feel. And whatever you say about Seamus McNeil, you know, he was certainly prepared to do that. Uh, he might not have given people the right, well he didn't give people the right to reply when they disagreed with him and that was the big failing that he had. Aye. But, you know, put your neck on the line. And if I don't, if I don't think of pipe bands, you know, they go in the huff with you. I mean, they, they don't, <laughs> well, they do. <laughs> you know, they, they absolutely don't talk to you. Aye. Pipers are the same, you say things about a piper. And I said, you know, that if his, if his uncle organises such and such a game, that's you that invite as a judge, that's you had it. You know, <laughs> but your but your first calling Aye. is to your Aye. first calling. Yes, absolutely. and that is, and if you're a, if you're a journalist, then you have to stand up and say it, and not just hide behind some kind of fence sitting. Uh, oh yes, uh, oh yeah, the oh, the lawns were wonderful today. Then on comes oh, Phil Marshall were fantastic, and oh, here's the power coming out. Oh yeah, wonderful, you know. And then, it's you not know, a great help. It's no great help. It's not taking no. us any further forward. Do you know? Not in the presentation. I, I know you've got strong views, and I tend to have the, the opposite views uh, about how bands should present themselves in the competition uh, arena, if you like. I don't. I hate the circle. I think an open circle would be so much better, and we'd hear the sound better. You mm -hmm. know, we're the only. We are the only musicians in the world who stand with their backsides to their listeners. 
in the concerts we don't do it, so why do we do it in competition? My, no my answer to that would be a, a, that un, unfortunately the audience is in four sides, or at least three sides of the band. Mm. And if you presented a, an open, a sort of semicircle if you like, then the audience on either side, is, what, what are they going to hear? Well, they'll hear more than what they hear at the moment. You see the point I'm making? Yeah, but they'll hear more than what they hear at the aye. moment. I mean, at the moment they're on that side, the one, for example, they're there and there and there. Aye. Aye. You know, well, an open circle wouldn't have changed things, you know, aye. that much. You know, they would pro probably be better and they could, this area could be bigger. See, in a concert hall, everybody's up on the stage and it's, it's fine because everybody's too. No, yes, but when you think about where did it come from, all it was was an army thing, form a circle. Aye. It was an army thing, it was never thought through as a musical presentation. Aye. You know, and they're turning it round is like, is trying to change an oil tank, and it'll know, it'll change because the bands are comfortable with Aye. it, you see, because they like the idea of the pipe major and the cosy thing. But, but they can face it into the pipe major and see his fingers. Aye, and but they can the still do that in an open circle. We can still do that, no bother, in an open circle. And this whole idea of judges walking around the circle is a nonsense as well, because they're all hearing it differently. And one reason yeah. why you've got piping is different is you get a, one piping judge hearing another one. They're hearing different things, you Especially know. Especially with the big bands, and it's different the, the 25 pipers, the it's 11 crazy. drummers, and all it's that crazy. sort of stuff. You know, it should be like the brass bands have it face your audience, an orchestra, so why can't, what's, if it's good enough for the Berlin Philharmonic, why is it not good enough for Pine Bands? I think really they, they need to refigure, uh, re uh, configure the, the audience, where the audience nah, are. That's, that's it, you know, and then have your judges all in front like that, nah. and but perhaps with your ensemble judge, or maybe your drumming judge at the right, because that's what he's wanting to hear, you know, but the rest of the guys at the front, so you're hearing the, 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 the unit. The Should band, there be a drumming judge? I don't think so. Well, a lot of people don't think so. I can see. I wouldn't mind it. The only thing is, it does bring up the standards. Yeah, but if it was judged through what I term the prism of the band, mm -hmm. not in isolation, Aye. you can have a drumming drum corps doing its own thing. In fact, I've seen them even forming a wee circle within a circle. They don't Aye. even look at the pipe major. Not and they're all right, doing it away. And they can win the drumming prize. Correct. And, it, and it's not helping the pipers no, one iota. And that's the point. So the problem is not the drumming prize. The problem is the drumming prize that doesn't take their contribution to the band into consideration. Aye. That's the problem. Nobody's got a problem with drummers getting prizes. But the drumming prize has to be given not only for technical brilliance, and they are all brilliant in grade one anyway, but also how well they help the, the band in their lifting their music. And the minute they start playing in isolation to the pipe core, that has to be condemned. See, I like some, uh, Brittany, for instance, have got 13 judges. Uh, uh, two competitions yeah. of the year. And uh, every judge is judging a different aspect. But there's no separate prizes awarded. There's only one prize awarded mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Well, we can learn a lot from them. Aye. In, in their presentation, Aye. in their... Um, you know, they're, they're judging the way the bands go on. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, I would like to see a more freeform thing as well, where the bands were allowed to. I think if we had a pipe band concert Aye. competition, you would, you know, each band has to come on 10 minutes, 5 minutes. And if you're moment. not marching on, uh, that uh, gives a, a greater scope to, the, in the medley, uh, to what tunes you're going to introduce. Why, why do we, yeah, why not? You know, I do think though that something needs to be done about Marks of Spades and Reels. Aye. They, you know, they need to stop bands playing the same Marks of Spades and Reels year after year after year. Mm -hmm. It's getting really monotonous, you know. L listening to the Marks of Spades and Reels can be one of the most rewarding things in a band contest, mm -hmm. but yet you look round and the stands are half empty. Why? Because the bands are not working hard enough at it to play well. They look for a clear run at the world's anyway, they look for a Straight run in the MSR, no major errors, get through without any major bluters, and then look for the magic in the medley. And I think there's something not quite right about it. They're not putting the work into the March of Spade Reel. When you hear, if you're a piper and you hear them all, you know, playing Pretty Marion, or any of the big reels, or the big Spade playing mm -hmm. coming to, and you hear all that work going in.
pin sharp with all the lift. That's that's as thrilling as any medley. Of course. Absolutely wonderful, but they're not putting the time in because they don't have to put the time in. They just look for a clean run in the MSR and they will try for the magic. It's all getting judged on the medleys, unfortunately. And not only that, but they're not being asked to learn new ones every year. They have to change it whereby if you get a prize with a March of Spain wheel, you know, if you're in the first three of the March of Spain wheel, you shouldn't be allowed to submit that the next year. But it's like um, the, the clasp competitions or the gold medal uh, competitions in Fever, yeah. you've got to learn new tunes every year. And there's something to be said about it's, that. That's what makes it special. Yeah. That's what makes and the prize. That puts the additional pressure You're on not just that. putting in your pot boilers. Yeah, yeah. You, they're telling you what you must learn. Yeah. And you have to learn it and take a chance with all the other yeah. guys. And that's what makes Owen and Inverness so much the better. I mean, I would like to see the Glenfinnich competition. It's the same pot boilers every year. Yeah, yeah. Every year. Mm -hmm. and but much better, much more status if they were saying we're going to play Inverness and Open tunes. Yeah. So you're not going to learn anything new, you've already learned them for Open Inverness, but you are going to have to play them up there and it's not the same tune that you played the year before. Robert, uh, I think we've covered a full gamut here today. Uh, we did start on Monday, it's running about Wednesday. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's something, something worth using that one. Thanks very much for your Thanks. time to Piper's Persuasion, another double P. Uh, so, it, no, it's very good to you. Thanks very much, Robert, and I'm quite sure that, that all those watching in the future uh, will learn a great deal from it. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me.